Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Uh, for our speaker today, we have Dr. Nathan Huber, who did his undergraduate at Gustavus Adolphus College, where he majored in physics, before coming to Mayo Clinic Graduate School, where he completed his PhD in biomedical engineering. And now he's a system scientist at GE, and today he's gonna tell us about computed tomography, image generation, image quality, and clinical applications. And I'll let him take it from here. Oh, thank you. Well, good afternoon, evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. We're gonna get the screen share ready, and then we will. Okay. Yeah, good now. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, I will just start out by saying, um, if you have any questions or have any follow up, feel free to just contact me. Uh, happy to. Happy to keep the discussion going. So my name is Nathan, as you just heard. Uh, this is my little family up in the top right, Anna and Hallie. Hallie is six months old as of last week. And as you heard, physics and chemistry in the background, as well as biomedical engineering. So I, I just appreciate kind of getting a general science background and then kind of diving in deep. And that's what I've done with deep learning, as you'll see today, later on. CT system scientist at GE Healthcare. I've been working at GE for six months and a week. So if you do the math, I started my job a week before I had the baby. And so a lot of world transitions at that point in my life. Um, yes, and here's my contact information. Feel free to reach out. Without further ado, we'll get right into CT image generation. Uh, Please stop me at any time during the talk. I'd be happy to go into more depth or explain something better. So to start medical imaging, there's many applications, many different ways of doing medical imaging. 
I kind of break it up into different mediums of medical imaging here. So we have x-rays, gamma rays, radio frequency, sound waves. And you can see some familiar things, especially computed tomography, PET, for example, MRI, ultrasound. So that just kind of gives you an appreciation for there's many different ways of looking inside the human body. On the left here, we have multiple examples of how how a patient looks in some different modalities. So you can have a radiograph, which is a projection view through the patient. You can have a CT image, which is like a slice through the patient. And then finally, you can have some 3D renderings, which gives you kind of a holistic view of the patient. Okay, so when we start this discussion on computed tomography, let's just kind of bring up some of the general imaging science concepts and see how they relate to computed tomography. So here we have a camera, which we're all very familiar with. Uh, you have an energy source, which is the sun. You have your subject, which is the individual here. And then you have your detector. And so what we're doing when we're measuring an image is we're taking that energy source. It's somehow interacting with the object we're measuring. And then we're like, detecting it, in this case, with the camera. In this case, with an X-ray detector. So very similarly, just like the sun is the source for a camera, we have an X-ray tube, which is the source of the X-rays. We have some things to like, adjust the X-rays so that they're optimal for patient imaging, such as a filter and a collimator. And then finally, it goes through the patient and is read by a detector. And then the cool thing about CT imaging is that all of this is done in a rotating basis. So you're getting an image from every angle of the patient, and then you're using all that information to distill what the, well, what is the makeup of the patient. And so here's a picture with the hood off of a CT gantry. And what you'll see is it spins around at amazing speeds. So this is probably going close to four times per second. Um, and then in a single rotation, it's getting close to 2000 views of the patient. So it's just an immense amount of data that's coming through the system and then transferring off of the gantry onto other electronic parts where we do some image processing. So my role in all of this is kind of at the very end, once all the data is acquired and processed, then I'm doing some final touches to the image using deep learning to make the images as good as possible for the radiologist. X-ray generation. So we'll just go through that CT system piece by piece. Um, again, feel free to stop me if you have questions. To start, we have an X-ray tube here, and this is converting um, electrons into X-rays. So to do this, we have a rotating anode here. Um, we boil off electrons. It hits the rotating anode and through a process called Brunstall lung radiation, it generates X-rays, which scatter in all directions, but we only have a small window, which is the place where we want the X-rays to go out towards the patient. There's many different factors of these x-rays to consider. So if you have increased MA, which just means you are boiling off more electrons, then you'll get more x-rays. That's kind of a kind of a proportional increase in the number of x-rays produced. We also have another knob we can do, which is the voltage between these two, the what we call the cathode and the anode. If you increase the voltage, then you'll get higher energy x-rays. So here you have a shift in the, um, the energy spectrum of the x-rays mm -hmm. produced. Next, we have to talk about x-ray interaction. So we've successfully made the x-rays. Now it's traveling towards the patient. As it goes through the patient, there's multiple different ways it can interact. So the first is just it can go right through the patient. The second is it can scatter. And that we, that's what we call the Compton effect. And so an incoming photon can change directions by scattering off of, um, in, this in this case, it's hitting an electron, transferring energy to that electron, and then 
with that energy transfer. It changes directions and changes wavelength. Another way we can interact is through the photoelectric effect. In this case, there is no immediate scattering of the X-ray. It's fully absorbed by the atom. All right. Any questions at this point? I'll just keep going. Okay, so next I'm going to walk through some of the big revolutions in CT technology over the decades. So, in terms of detector technology, in around the 2000s era, we came out with multi-slice detection. And so, here you can see that these detectors, instead of just acquiring one slice, have a width to them. So, you can get, obtain many images at a time. And with that, you can also have helical scan modes, which are really efficient because it kind of, it, it's just is like continuous detection, um, like the, the patient moves continuously through the detector, and then you're able to get that full 3D volume. In the 2010s, we had dual energy X-ray become more and more popular. There's a couple different ways of doing this. So here we have um, a dual source detection detector, and you can see at 90 degree increments, we have two X-ray sources, two detectors. They're at different energies. Another way of doing this is doing fast KV switching, which is every, every projection view, you have a high energy projection than a low energy projection. Okay, and then the importance of dual energy is because it gives you an ability to differentiate materials. So an important thing is for that photoelectric effect that we talked about earlier, it has a Z dependence or like a material dependence. And so if you have two different energies, you can tease out this material dependence and thus know more information about the patient. So in this image, like this is grayscale, this is grayscale, you don't have a very good understanding of what's actually making up the patient. Um, but in this iodine image, now you're able to decompose into different materials. And so all of a sudden you're able to do like quantitative CT work, which is really valuable. And then in the recent decade, we're coming out with photon counting detection. So every major vendor is working hard towards photon counting. And this is the difference between kind of these energy, energy integrating detectors, which look a lot like black and white TVs, and then these photon counting detector scanners, which look a lot like color TVs. <laughs> so to put it simply, um, in an energy integrating detector, all of the energy goes through a, a, um, a, a scintillator, which converts the X-rays into visible light. And then there's a photodiode that converts the visible light into an electronic signal, and that's what you read. So that's what has been done since the dawn of CT in the 70s. But for photon counting, we're using the semiconductor, which can convert the X-rays directly into that digital signal. Um, and so we read out like these full pairs that are created from the semiconductor interacting with the, with the X-rays. And there's multiple value propositions to doing it this way. So one, you're able to just remove some of the noise because you know that the noise is gonna be relatively low energy relative to an actual detection of a photon. So you're able to remove a lot of the noise Another thing is very high spatial resolution capabilities. So these semiconductors, you can make them kind of essentially quite, well, about four times smaller than you've been able to do the traditional energy integrated detectors. So that's a huge value proposition as well. And then there's multiple other ones just about being able to differentiate materials better. Um, and so as, as I said, the whole field is kind of, they've kind of picked photon counting as the future of CT. And now we're trying to develop these scanners and make them ready for clinical use. And then in the future, after we've gotten tired of the photon counting technology, we can go into phase contrast, which is just a whole nother, whole nother way of extracting information from, um, from tissue. So 
everything I've showed you so far is looks a lot like this transmission image, but similar to that, you can actually look at the phase of the X-rays passing through the material. Or you can look at this thing called dark field, which is how how scattering, like how much scattering is occurring within the tissue. So these are just really innovative ideas at this point. It's really hard to imagine an implementation in the clinical CT scanner, but that's where that's a possibility. For the future. All right. Is there any questions about the the CT system? Detector technologies. So you mentioned that with the photon count, you also didn't tie the Are those just inherently tied together, or can you get a higher level without being Yeah, yeah. So it's it's uh it's a consequence of this way of that we're detecting the X rays. So again, the semiconductor is just very efficient like spatially. Um, in this scintillation, photodiode, um, then you get into electronics. That you have like an inherent, it's inherently larger because of the way that the light spreads out within the scintillator. And then you have to block it so that it doesn't isn't read in adjacent pixels. So it's more a property of the detection. You if you want to create an image like an integration detector, you can always do that integration on the photon counting system and still have the transmission. That's a good question. In the back. That's a that's a great question. So um, with uh, GE, what we're working with is uh, silicon, and so. The, the benefit of silicon is it's a very pure material, so we're able to get like really good energy resolution. The downfall of silicon is it's relatively low attenuation, so you have to have you have to have a thick silicon wafer. Um, so what the innovation that GE is is working on is edge detection with a silicon wafer. So if you have your detector made on the edge, then you can have it be full thick while maintaining that good material property of silicon for detection. Uh, but there's other there's other like um, perovskite materials that other vendors are working with for the semiconductors. I want to follow up with that. Uh, if you're using silicon, is that a like lithography process that you use? Yep, that's absolutely right. All right. So next we can talk about linear attenuation coefficient. So like I said, what we're trying to do in CT is detect how much interactions are occurring when the X-ray passes through the tissue. Linear attenuation coefficient is the material property that we're looking at. So I have like this fancy graph here, um, but we can, we can quite simply look right here at the bottom and just look at this and say, okay, if we have some number of input x-rays, this I naught, and then we have the output x-rays here, I, we can see that there's an exponential attenuation. So um, as it travels through a la larger material, this L, um, there's this, um, this mu that is the linear attenuation coefficient. And that's different for different materials, uh, but you can kind of piece together how, like, as you travel through more tissue, you will get this exponential decrease in the amount of x-rays passing through the tissue. Like I said, this changes for different materials. So iodine is, um, iodine has a larger attenuation as seen here. So the mu, or the lambda, sorry, the mu is larger than for things like adipose tissue and glandular tissue. This comes from the difference between Compton scattering and photoelectric effect. So we can go into more depth if there's any questions there, but um, that's the physical property that we're measuring the CT. And then this physical property, the linear attenuation coefficient, converts into what we call Hounsfield units, is what 
which is what the radiologist eventually looks at. And so we have it essentially normalized with respect to water using this formula here. And the output numbers and CT numbers of an image range from about a neg negative 1,000 to 2,000, roughly on, the, on that order of magnitude. And so we have air, which is very dark. We have very dark air. And then the lungs, there's a little bit of air, a little bit of tissue, so that's a little bit higher than air. Then we have fat, which again is a little bit um, lower than water. Water is zero by definition. And then we have these other materials, bone being a high density material, and then metal being very, very um, absorption. absorption. And yeah, so what we're what we're essentially doing is calculating the linear attenuation coefficient of individual components of this image, or 3D volume. So once we have all this data, projection, thousands of projections from around the patient, we have to do the reconstruction. And that the math terms for this is radon transfer, radon, radon inverse, radon transform inversion. Okay, so if you imagine this, what we do is we acquire this image from multiple different angles, and then we have this, what we call a sinogram. And then the act of reconstructing that sinogram is what we obtain, what we're trying to do with CT. So I, I give a schematic, which probably simplifies it even more. Uh, so what we have is projections, and the act of back projection or this radon transform inversion is taking these projections and trying to calculate what the image looks like. And so one way to do this is just smearing those projections back into the image and you can see that the places where it overlaps, the projection overlaps, you get a higher density. And so if you have many, many views, you can start to see where that density lies in the image. And then filtered back projection is just a way of accounting for the oversampling of low frequency information that is held in traditional back projection. So finally, this is just a computer simulation. Um, you can see that if you have all of these projection views and you do this reconstruction with the filtered back projection, you can obtain the image that is that like the the hidden image from the sinogram. So here we have the southern Minnesota atrophy. All right. So are there any questions about acquisition, reconstruction? I know it was a uh, just pretty quick overview. Yeah. Yeah, so great question. So the radon transform is actually not math that is done in the scanner. It's actually during the acquisition. So that's something like if you have an image, you can do the radon transform to get to the sinogram. But for CT imaging, we're only concerned about going from the sinogram to the image. So it's really the inversion that we're interested in. And your question is, is this done on the scanner or like Great question. So it's off of the scanner. Yeah. Pretty much all the scanner does is transfer the data. Uh, it, that's that's a pretty big task because there's so much of it coming up in the gantry. All right, then we'll go into image quality assessment. So this is actually a bigger component of my particular job because all the reconstruction has already been done. What I'm doing is trying to do that last bit of image processing and image quality assessment. So here, let's just start by looking at this image and say, which image is better? Does anybody have any sense of which image they would prefer to diagnose off of in this particular case? I like A. Jonathan likes A. Anybody like B? What in the back? All right. Yes, 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 B. Um, so 
I guess the silly answer is it depends what you're looking for. <laughs> um, in this particular image, like you might be looking at the soft tissue, in which case you like that there's very low noise and you can see some aspects of the soft tissue pretty clearly in the A image. But then maybe you're looking at something very fine, like in the vasculature, like you can see some vasculature here in the back and the muscle. You might be looking at the bone where you like that high contrast information. So it depends what you're looking for. And luckily there are ways of doing both with the reconstruction process. So radiologists can look at both of these images, whichever is better for the thing that they're diagnosing. And here's just another example. For the lung, we definitely are going to be looking at this B image because that's very sharp and you can see a lot of the airways that are really important. All right, so next we're going to talk about noise. This is another thing that I've worked a lot with. Um, so I did my whole dissertation on noise reduction in CT imaging. So in this case, what I showed you previously, there was no noise in the image. It was just a very clean logo of IEEE. More realistically, we have some amount of noise. Um, so this is just because we're counting projections. This is um, Poisson noise. That's just counting statistics. So again, we have this finite dose. We have a little bit of noise in the image. But there's also a push in medical imaging to reduce radiation dose as much as possible. So depending on the scan, you might be able to do a very low dose scan, which is on the right. And then you have a lot of noise in the image. Um, so again, noise in itself isn't helpful, uh, but it's kind of an inherent process of this reconstruction. There's multiple different ways of measuring noise. Most commonly, you just take an ROI, take the standard deviation of the pixels in that region. Um, another way to look at noise is in terms of the noise frequency content. And so here we have the noise power spectrum, um, which is just like a way to transform of uniform noise patches to distill where, where is the noise coming from in terms of frequency. Then we have resolution. So those that liked Image B, you like a lot of resolution. Good for you. <laughs> I also like resolution. Um, so the the trade off of noise is resolution. So a lot of times, if you have low noise, you'll also have low resolution. But if you have high noise, then you can have some higher <laughs> higher resolution. So many factors go into this. Reconstruction kernel is probably the biggest one. So this is the way the radiologists look at the the smooth image or the sharp image, we often call it. To measure resolution, we can look at what, what, what we have up here, which is a bar phantom. So if you look at the sharp image on the right, you can see that there's many line pairs here. And so if you scan this phantom, you can kind of look at what module you're able to see to. So maybe this module. Then there's a lookup table that tells you the scanner's resolution after that. Alternatively, you can look at the frequency content again. So here's a wire phantom. And if you take the Fourier transform of this, then you're able to distill what is the maximum frequency you're able to see with this scanner. So that's another good way to measure resolution. But then there's other forms of resolution. So here we look at the slice thickness resolution. So to do this, you can have image like a very thin disk and see how many adjacent images that disk shows up, shows up in. And the fewer images that it shows up in, that's the higher resolution scan. Low contrast detectability is perhaps even more important than noise level because noise level is kind of arbitrary. What are you looking for? Um, but with the low contrast detectability, then you're looking at something like contrast to noise ratio. So if you're looking at something with a high contrast or like a bright signal, then you can have more noise. Um, if you have a very low contrast or low signal, then you're probably gonna need a very low noise level in order to see that object. So this is just the signal background minus signal object over standard deviation or noise level. 
to calculate contrast stimulation. But there are gobs of other artifacts to be concerned with. So we have streak artifacts, we have motion artifacts, beam hardening artifacts, which is dark bands in the image like this. We have metal artifacts. So if you have metal in a metal implant, then the image can be distorted because of that. There's ring artifacts that occur because of faulty detector pixel or something like that. Um, and then here's another example of a ring artifact. So it, it's really nice for people like me who did their degree in image processing because it's job security. There will always be artifacts to correct for. And that's where I come into play. So this kind of comes back to my um, thesis defense. Uh, this is what I worked on in grad school. So I looked at deep learning image processing. If you imagine taking a low dose image and a routine dose image, because of the different photon counting statistics, you have different noise levels. And so instead of having a radiologist look at this noisy image, you could have deep learning look at that image and try to remove the noise and keep the important structure. So this has been catching on quite quickly within the medical imaging community because it's able to outperform a lot of the traditional image processing techniques that we've looked at. And here's just an example of how far this can go. So if this, if you look at this input image, you see how hard it is to differentiate all the fine structures in here. If you look at the deep learning image in the middle, now you can see that you can make out all these fine vasculatures, all these GI related anatomies, all of these bone structures. You can distill a lot more information from that image in the middle. On the right, we just have a reference image. Like if you were to actually acquire the image with four times the dose level, this is what the image would look like. So you can check and see what you like better here. All right, let's talk about a few clinical applications. First, I wanted to see if there's any questions about image quality. All right. I got one. Okay. Besides the computational techniques that can help us pull around for artifacts, has the transition to photon counting changed those sort of traditional artifact capabilities? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So the question was did photon counting change the artifacts in our image? And it absolutely does. I'd say all of the artifacts are there. But some of them are less there than they used to be. <laughs> Beam hardening is less there. Beam hardening is less there. Yes. So, um, for example, with photon counting, you can do fancy tricks like because you're able to see which X rays are higher energy. Now you can make an image with higher energy, and then there will be less beam hardening because beam hardening is a it just arises from the low energies being attenuated. So if you only look at the high energies, you're going to have less of that beam hardening artifact. So that's less. Metal artifact is less. Um, let's see, what else? Work uh, um, on counting artifacts. Let's just look at these, at the list of artifacts we got here. Um, Yeah, so in theory, streak artifact, you could use the same concept of using those high energy x rays to reduce that. Um, I think we covered them all, though. That should be, in terms of noise, the electronic noise, like I said, you can kind of remove that from the signal. So noise is less in photon counting, theoretically. So lots of good motivations for using. All right, then we'll move on to clinical applications. So CT is used just about everywhere in the body. So we're gonna go through some head and neck applications, chest and cardiac, abdomen, pelvis, musculoskeletal. It's used for many different things. Diagnosis of new disease. It's used for screening. So you don't have, you hopefully don't have something, but you wanna check. Uh, treatment planning. So 
maybe you have an upcoming treatment now you can get a good image of the body and then it can like inform the their decisions during that treatment it's used for follow-up interventional trauma so because it's such a fast modality like an entire body acquisition takes on the order of seconds because it can be done so quickly um, that's really nice for trauma another thing that's nice is that you can metal or image metal because <clears throat> like in an M MRI scanner, which is a big competitor, um, you can't have metal in the scanner because it uses magnet magnetism. So lots of good benefits of CT. Let's go look at some head and neck cases. Um, so up top, we have a fairly typical head CT scan. Um, we look at it in two different windows. On the left is the window that shows the soft tissue. So that's what, if you're looking for like brain masses and stuff like that. On the right, we look at bone tissue. So if you're looking for fractures. Um, here on the bottom, we have some pathologies. So here's a fracture right here. This is some internal bleeding. There's also abnormalities in the ventricles that could be imaged, and then masses such as on the right here. Another thing is you can in, use contrasts to make things light up that are that have vasculature. So here we have, you can visualize this aneurysm because we have contrast on board. Again, contrast is a highly attenuating material, so that's why it shows up so brightly in the image. Mm -hmm. Another cool thing is inner ear images. And so I really like this application because it requires the optimal resolution of the scan. You kind of pull out all the knobs and try to make the sharpest image you can because the inner ear is a very small structure. Um, here, for example, there's, there's like a very small bone structure here uh, that you'd hopefully like to image and be able to make a, a judgment on. Chest and cardiac. Again, these are, for chest imaging especially, it's a high resolution task because you want to be able to see all the airways, see if there's any um, things going on in the lung. So here we have some fibrosis that's coming up in the lung. Here's an image of what a patient with COVID-19 might have in the lung. Lung nodules. So it's very hard to see this lung nodule right there in the bottom right. It might even be, it's probably even harder to see, but just the tiniest little structure there, that's what a radiologist might be looking for. Um, and then here we have in the soft tissue window, lymph nodes. So again, many different things to be seen. Cardiac is a fun application because the heart is beating. So you have to have a really fast scan in order to acquire the full heart without it moving around and then you're trying to image something that's moving and then it gets messy. So uh, you, in, for this application, you wanna have the gantry spinning at maximum speed. There's other ways of doing this with gating. So if you have kind of multiple blips of images, then you can piece them together and make the heart. Um, those blips occur like within the heart cycle. So you're trying to get the heart when it's not moving. So when it's when it's going through contraction, you pump the blood through the body, that's not a good time to image the heart, but once it's at its like peak, um, like once it um, peaked dialysis, or is that the word? There it is. <laughs> um, that's when you would bump to uh, image the heart. Abdomen pelvis, um, again, multiple things. Uh, we have cancerous masses potentially, Here's the pancreas. Again, you want to be able to see structures in the pancreas. Here's a kidney mass. So it's it's just really important to have that ability to view internally within the body, and then CT enables that in a very efficient manner. So lots of applications have arisen. Now we also look at the pelvis here. So the interesting application I point out here is metal artifact reduction. So because metal is such an absorption, absorptive materials, you can have a lot of artifact around a metal object. So 
all the companies have ways of reducing that artifact. And so you can look on the right and see how much better that image is. Um, so that's another thing that we play around with. For musculoskeletal, we're also going to be looking at masses. Um, this is a whole body low dose CT scan. This is another thing that I did my dissertation on. Um, so this is an interesting application because it's within bone, but it's not necessarily high resolution. It's kind of like very subtle structures that um, the interior of the bone is being eaten out by the cancer. So that's what we're trying to image. So. Uh, we're making a lot of progress there with photon counting and deep learning. All right, so that gets us through the clinical applications. Um, I have I have another little tutorial that I can show, um, but is there any questions about the talk portion? Of what we have we looked at today? Oh, right in the back. Absolutely. So you you do pick the energy of the X-ray based on what's being imaged. Um, however, like it's it's pretty common that it's around 120 kV. Uh, there's kind of fluctuations. So you might go to up to 140, or you might go down to, you know, maybe like 100 or 80. Um, so some factors that come into play. The higher the energy of the X-rays the more it's going to be able to pass through a patient. So if you have a larger patient, for example, that might be a motivation to use a higher energy beam so that you're able to get more signal. Um, a motivation for having a lower energy beam is because there's more of that photoelectric effect, and so you're able to do more material differentiation. There's a higher contrast in the image because you're having more of that photoelectric effect component. So, great question. There is there is some tunability there. All right. With the uh, multi-slice CT, mm -hmm. can we do an entire part without any training with the axes? Yeah, yeah, great question. Can we do an entire part with multi-slice CT? So, there's certainly vendors that have created very, very large detectors that can do that. I think probably your run of the mills multi slice detector, you're going to have to still do like a couple wide slices. Um, but yeah, there are vendors out there that have very large detectors that can do the whole heart one go. Yeah. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> I I guess I don't have numbers, but um, like if you look at the the multi slice detector, so oh. all right. So let's just say there there are like sixty four slices being acquired here. Then there might be like. 100 or so um, in the horizontal direction. So let's just say 60 times 100. So there we got like 6,000 uh, things coming off of the detector array, but then you're taking 4,000 per rotation. So there's 6,000 times, uh, 6, times a couple thousand. So now we're getting into the tens of, well, okay. I'm, I'm going to stop doing the math, but <laughs> then we also have many different slices. So like patient with six feet, we have like, you know, a detector that maybe is covering this much. So it just multiplies by a lot. Um, I don't, I don't work a lot with the raw, raw data. So I don't know the like, exact data sizes, but what I do know is it takes, it takes time to do all that data transfer and to do the processing. So. I think there's a lot of innovations out there that will come to increase that data transfer, increase that processing time, or decrease the processing time. So, good question. All right, any other questions? 
So I will very quickly go through a little tutorial on deep learning image processing. So this is something that I generated during my graduate school experience. So this will, this will give you kind of a sense of things that I work with. Um, and it'll also um, hopefully give you an ability to see the code and kind of see how, like, more from the engineering perspective, how these things are done. Okay, so first, we're going to be using Python today, and it's going to be powered by TensorFlow libraries and Keras libraries. Um, so first, we just have to download or get all these um, libraries at our ready. And then we're going to or get the data. And so we have it saved here via Google. So we'll just um, download this data. All right, then we're going to just transfer the data into inputs and targets. That's what this cell is going to do. Sorry, these, these early ones aren't nearly as interesting, so I'm going through pretty quick. <laughs> All right, and then we have these helper functions that we'll use later. All right, so this is going to give us an example of the data that we're using. So again, we want low dose data. And what we're trying to do is remove noise from this left image to create something very low noise, such as this routine dose image. So the goal of the neural network today is going to go from a noisy image to a low noise image. And so essentially, we're going to be trying to subtract off this noise that we see in the difference image. All right, so what we're going to use is a convo convolutional neural network, or a CNN. So it's a mathematical process where we have conv convolutional layers. These convolutional layers are applied across the image, and they extract image features from the image. So if you, if you look at this schematic here, uh, when you have a convolutional layer applied to the image, it's this sliding window function that it just extracts like a tiny portion of the image. And then if you stack many of these layers on top of each other, you can see how that feature is extracted into other features. And then you kind of get an increasingly complicated network that's able to like extract a lot of information from the image. Once you take an image and distill it down to its very basic features with the neural network. Then the neural network is tasked to reconstruct the target image, which is a low noise version. So what it's trying to do is differentiate what are the features that are corresponding to anatomy and what are the features that are corresponding to the noise and the artifact that we're trying to remove. So that's kind of the high level view of what we're trying to accomplish. In this cell, we are going to look at what the actual convolutional network looks like in this case. So we have the number of layers being six. six. We have the number of filters, uh, 64. So each convolutional layer will extract 64 features. Then we have the kernel size. So like I say, there's a small kernel that's sliding over the image in order to extract all this information. So it's a three by three kernel. Strides is telling you how fast it's going to translate over the image. So we assign that. The activation function is essentially how the information is passed from convolutional layer to convolutional layer. So in ReLU activation, you're only looking at the positive fluctuations, and then you're kind of removing all that low, the low information. So, but that gives you the nonlinearity of the neural network. And then we have to de define our model. So what we're using is again, Keras is very helpful here. We're able to do kind of this thing that we assign the input shape, for example. So in this case, we'll just take any shape, and that's why we're saying none here. And then we're going to have one dimension, so that means this is going to be a grayscale image. All right, 
Then we're going to do some basic rescaling of the data so that we can have um, we can have it normalized to like a magnitude of one, which is just kind of helpful for the for the network training. Next, we're going to actually make the network. So again, it might it might seem complicated when people are talking about putting together these convolutional neural networks, but the, in this ten lines of code, we make a neural network right here. So I'll just tell you how we do it. So first we have a for loop that goes, it goes from zero to six because we said there was going to be six layers. And then what you see is that it takes and it operates on this X and then it puts out an X. And so what you're, what the reason, like, since we have a for loop, what you can see is it's stacked together. So the output of one convolutional layer is the input of the next convolutional layer. Okay, so we have keras.layers.conv2d. That means we're going to be assigning a convolutional layer. Then we have some other descriptors such as filters, kernel size, strides. Then after all that, we have our activation function and then we repeat. So hopefully this demystifies what a convolutional neural network looks like in code. Uh, the final layer is just going to output the image into the same dimensions that we want the image to look like at the end of the day. All right, so now that we've gotten a nice convolutional neural network made, we have to actually train the neural network. So neural networks, you have your, your network itself, but then you have the training data, which tells the network what operation you're trying to accomplish. So here we have the number of iterations through the training data. We have the batch size, which is how many images it's going to look at before it goes to the next operations. Uh, we have learning rate, which is telling us how fast it's going to learn. Um, we have the optimizers, which is telling us, um, like, this is a pretty challenging problem for the network to, like, look at all these images and get to the optimal solution. So this is telling us how it's going to do that optimization. And then this, these are just some other parameters to help us um, look at the images at the end. Okay, then we have our actual training function. Okay, so the inputs of the training function are the loss function and the model. So we just made the model in the previous step. The loss function is how we can tell the model if it's getting better. So in our case, what we're going to do is we're going to compare pixels. And we're just going to make sure that those pixels are getting closer and closer to the target image by training the network. So that's that's what we're going to measure, essentially accuracy of our output to our target image. All right. Um, so for each epoch, we're going to calculate some losses. Um, we're going to apply, we're going to predict. We're going to use our current model to predict, and then we're going to um, save out that image so that we can see it later on. All right, so I'll actually run through training. So as you can imagine for this quick tutorial, this isn't near optimal. <laughs> we're, we're just gonna kind of demo what it can do, uh, but it's not gonna be an optimal solution. So we, we'd like to make it so it can train in about a minute. So as you can see, it's going through all the data, it's calculating the loss function, the loss is getting lower and lower with every epoch, which means that it's getting better in our predicted predictive task. All right, and then it says training phase complete. Now we can move on to that next step and see what sort of images we produce. So this is just using matplotlib library, and we're going to make a figure. It's going to have multiple um, images, so it's going to be a subplot. It's going to have our input. All right, it's going to have multiple different stages of the training process. So before optimization, the CNN has no idea what it's going to be asked to do. So you can see that it applies to the image and it looks terrible because it doesn't really know what, it's, what sort of features it wants to extract. After only one epic, so looking at 36 images, I believe, it's able to vastly improve. It's a huge improvement from that before optimization to the first epic. 
Then every epoch after that is kind of a smaller and smaller incremental change. So five ep epochs in, now you can see that it's maintaining some of these smaller structures even better. At the final stage, now this is hopefully going to be the optimal resolution, but it also has the lowest noise. So you can see it's very, it's very low noise. It doesn't have that granular texture. It's very uniform and soft tissue region, for example. And then finally, we apply inference, which is once you have your neural network trained, you apply it to your new data, and this is the output image that we produce. So here's, here's our input, here's the CNN denoise output. You can see that a lot of the granular texture is gone. Unfortunately, because this isn't a great network, this is just like a pretty brief tutorial, uh, there's, there's some structures that are missing. So you can see here that the bone it was removed a little bit. Um, so with more training, hopefully you can preserve the bone even better. All right, now I'm going to skip to the very end where we show you the latest and greatest in CNN denoising technology. So on the left, we have our low dose input image. Then we have our demonstration CNN, which is what I showed you today. And then on the right, we should have an individual CNN denoising, which is trained much longer with much more data. And you can see how much better we're able to get than even that demo CNN. Like, look at these um, fine structures here in the abdomen. You can almost not even see it in our basic demonstration. Uh, but again, Deep learning does better and better. The more data you give it, the more time you give it to train. So that's, that's why we were able to improve the performance in this particular image. So with that, I'm wrapping up the talk. Thank you so much. It was really fun speaking to you all. I'm very happy to answer more questions. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this was this was some work that came out of the Mayo Clinic where they showed that usually you think of uh, noise reduction as having to apply broadly to all patients. But um, if you are able to take an individual patient and extract the data, you can make that individual patient's specific training data set, which will be optimal for extracting the features associated with that patient. So what they, what they showed at the Mayo Clinic is, again, if you customize the CNN to the individual patient, you can do better than if you have a broadly performing CNN. Does that require additional data from that patient that you wouldn't otherwise need? Uh, no, so it's it's using a bootstrap method. So if you take a patient that you just acquired and then you add noise to it and then you remove noise from it and you add more noise to it, remove more noise, you can kind of bootstrap your way into training what noise looks like in that patient and then remove it from your original data set. So it was a very clever technology that Andrew Misser uh, developed. Mm. Oh, that's, that's good. Well, if you were to go first go in for CT scan, how long would it take to collect the data? Excellent question. So the actual acquisition, for most, I mean, for most uh, exams, it would, would probably only take about 30 seconds to acquire all the data. Now, if you have multiple series that you're running, 
or something like that, then that's going to be longer because they have to set up the scan and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the biggest time commitments are like, you know, bringing the patient to the room, um, like getting them situated on the scanner, making sure that you have them aligned just right. The actual acquisition takes very, very little time. Then the data is transferred to computers. Um, and that's where like the reconstruction is occurring. That process can take anywhere from minutes to hours, depending on how big of a data set that you collected. Um, hopefully more on the minutes time frame, because for a lot of applications, we're wanting to give the image to the radiologist very quickly. But again, like, especially when you go into like really fancy noise reduction algorithms and stuff like that, then the radiologist might be able to wait an hour to let the data be good process before they read the image. But yeah, good question. One more. Yeah. Have you ever do any filtering on grams? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we don't do noise reduction on the cytograms too much. I like. With deep learning, we're able to do deep learning reconstruction more so now than we have in the past, which is able to like use some of that information. Uh, but if we look beyond noise reduction, then there's other things like in projections that have a lot of like bone or metal, there's very, very low signal. And it's nice to be able to like correct the data in those very low signal regions before reconstruction so that you don't generate as severe of an artifact. So that's the sort of processing that's done before you do the reconstruction, like looking at the data, seeing where there's like, you know, chunks of data missing. If there's chunks of data missing, you want to replace it before you do the reconstruction. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for coming out. It was really nice talking to all of you. Feel free to ask any questions after the talk. Feel free to contact me. Thank you.